Okay, so today we're talking about significant figures and density, and we're also going to talk about accuracy and precision and some of those kinds of things that we'll be using in the lab. So if you've never done significant figures, you're going to do it today. Uh, if you have your calculator, go ahead and pull that out because you're going to be using it today as well. Uh, it's okay to use a calculator on your phone during class. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but just remember, you can't use your phone on a test or on a quiz. Okay, so let's talk about some vocab. Accuracy and precision are two words that get used interchangeably in our culture, but they don't mean the same thing to us as scientists. Okay, and we're going to see that a lot in chemistry. There are a lot of words that our culture, our society uses in a non-scientific way, and they're not necessarily being used correctly. And accuracy and precision are two of those words that get used a lot, and they don't actually get used correctly most of the time. So accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true value. They're a true value, right? Because let's think about it. When you measure anything, it is an approximation, right? Some measurements have less approximation than others, right? So if you're using a really, 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 really accurate balance to record mass, right? You're closer to the true value than if you're using a really lousy scale. Right? When I go to the doctor's office and I stand on the scale, it doesn't have 14 decimal places after it. It rounds to the nearest pound, or maybe half a pound. Right? I might have one decimal place. Uh, or if you go to the doctor's office and they have one of those ones that is the metal bar that just slides around, that's even more. Right? There's my true mass, and then there's my measured mass. So how close you are to the true value, that's what we call accuracy. Okay? There's the actual amount, and then there's the measured amount. The closer you are to the actual amount, that's what we call accuracy. And then precision is how repeatable you are. In other words, if you do the same measurement five times, how close are those data points to each other? If you get 1.111 the first time, and then 1.73 the second time, whoo, that's not very repeatable, right? How close they are to each other, that's called precision. So if you can do it the same every time we say that you're precise, right? So if you are um, throwing darts, right? Throwing darts at the dartboard, and you're always hitting the same spot, that would be precise. It may not be accurate, it'll only be accurate if you're hitting the bullseye, right? But if you're always hitting somewhere off to the left, it always goes the same spot, right? That would be precise. It may not be accurate, but it could be precise. You could be both. So here's an example with, you know, playing basketball with your wadded up piece of trash, right? It always goes into the baskets every single time. You're, so you're hitting the target and you're repeatable, right? So that's why this is both accurate and precise, right? Because you were where you wanted to be and every time you did it, it went in. This would be precise, right? Because you're repeatable. You're always hitting the same spot. So that's why you're precise, but you're not hitting the goal. That's why you're not accurate. And then this is what a lot of them would look like, right? It'd just be all over the place because it's hard to throw a wadded up piece of paper in the same spot every time unless you really practice it. And then there's a dartboard example. What's this one? That's what my dartboard looks like. Right, that's neither. Good. What's this one? You're precise, right? Because you're always hitting the same spot. But are you accurate? And then this one, that's what you want. Right? That's both accurate and precise. Does everyone understand how to use those two terms? So in a lab, we're obviously not going to play darts. We're not going to be throwing baskets. But we are making measurements, right? That's why we make the same measurement multiple times. If you record the mass three times and they're all really close to each other, we can assume that you are precise, right? And then if we know the actual value, we can decide how close you are in terms of accuracy. All right, so again, when we make measurements, there's always some sort of uncertainty, right? There's the true value, and then there's the measured value. Now, the measured value comes directly from what you're using to make that measurement, right? If you're using a sloppy piece of equipment, you're going to get a sloppy result. If you get a good piece of equipment, you're using a, a, a good result, right? So if we have, um, when it says metallic rectangular solid, what that is, right? So you've got some sort of bar. We're going to be using these in lab a lot. They're highly durable, and you can identify metals pretty easily. All right, so we've got some sort of bar that we are measuring 
on two different rulers. I mean, we don't need to use a lot of brain-busting science to figure out which one of these is going to give us the better result. Which one is it, ruler A or ruler B? B, why? Which one's gonna, why is that gonna give us a better measurement than ruler A? Right, we don't have as much approximation, right? The tick marks here are in, let's see, that's one, two, so that's 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1. So these are in point ones, right? So you notice it's between 4.1, 4.2, it's between 4.2 and 4.3, right? So I'm gonna guess it's 4.25. Right, because I always have to approximate a little bit. So this is between 4.2 and 4.3, so I'm going to call it 4.25. Here, all I know is it's between 4 and 5. And now this is really open to interpretation, right? I know it's not halfway, but is it a third of the way to halfway? I don't know. I might call it 4.3, you might call it 4.2. Someone else who's got different visual acuity might call it 4.1, right? It just depends on you. <laughs> There's a lot more mistake that could be made here than here, right? Because this is a more accurate piece of uh, instrument. It's going to give us a, a, a better value that's closer to the true value than this would go. All right? Does that make sense? So that's why we use significant figures. When we, as scientists, make a measurement, we use what's called significant figures. And it's really important that you understand why we use sig figs. Because we're going to spend the whole day today, or a good chunk of today, talking about rules for significant figures and how we do calculations with significant figures. And if you don't understand why we're using sig figs in the first place, it's just going to seem like a bunch of rules you have to memorize, because I'm telling you, you have to memorize them. Okay? We use sig figs to tell others how accurately we made this measurement. Okay, this value, 4.25 versus, let's just call it 4.3, right? This value has more decimal places, it's a more accurate measurement. It has more significant figures than this one does. So by telling the reader of my data table, hey, this value's got three sig figs, this value's only got two, the, I as a reader know that the data table value 4.25 was made more accurately than the value 4.1 or 4.2 or 4.3, right? Depending on who's looking at that. Does this make sense? Do you see why we're using sig figs? It's so that someone looking at my data table can see how accurate I was. And you can do that very quickly. I can look at your data table and go, yeah, you've got lots of decimal places here. Great. You were working very accurately, or as accurately as you could, right? Or maybe you don't have any decimal places. Ooh. Sometimes you don't need to be all that accurate. We'll talk about when that is an issue. So this is why I spend time talking about what sig figs are, significant figures communicate to others how accurately we make a measurement. That's why we do it. We don't do it because I say so, although that is part of the reason why you do it. You are doing it because I say so. But why am I telling you you need to do it? I'm telling you you need to do it because that's how we tell others how accurate we were. Right? Because in the lab, we make measurements. Um, our accuracy has a big impact on how seriously someone's going to take me. Right? If I am making a claim based on my data, and my data are lousy, you're probably not going to take me very seriously. If I make a claim and my data are very good, you're probably more likely to take me seriously. Uh -huh. Maybe you're onto something. Right? So greater number of significant figures correlates usually to a more accurate measurement. Now, of course, if you're just real sloppy and you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you might have a whole bunch of sig figs, but if you were being lousy in the lab and you weren't paying attention, there is that, that aspect as well, which we would just have to hope that you're not being sloppy. So looking at these three pieces of equipment, which one would most accurately measure mass with the greatest number of sig figs? C, right? Because this one's going to give me decimal places. It looks like it's got four decimal places. I'm going to guess at best I might get one decimal place out of both of these, maybe two decimal places. That one actually looks like it. No, that's measured in twos. So, yeah, I'm going to get one decimal place at best on the both of these. Actually, no, that one will give me two decimal places. That'll give me four. All right. So, let's look at another example. We have a reaction where the solution turns from colorless to blue. And we're going to time how long this reaction takes. Okay? You're going to use stopwatch A, you're going to use stopwatch B, you're going to use stopwatch C. Okay? 
Okay. There's the initial time. You hit go. You hit go. You hit go. All at the same time. Whose stopwatch is going to give us the most accurate result? C, right? C. Because why? It's got the least amount of approximation, right? We were at. We know that it was 35 seconds. We actually know that it was 35. Not 35.0, 35.08, so 35 and 8 hundredths, right? Where I stopwatch A, we rounded it to tenths, and then 35, there's no decimal place there. Okay, so we need to have rules or guidelines to figure out how many significant figures are in a measurement, right? Because a measurement's accuracy is based on number of sig figs, so we need to know, okay, how many sig figs are in my measurement? So any digit that is not a zero, so one through nine, if it is a value one through nine, it is significant. If it's a zero, that's where the rules get a little bit fishy. But if it is a non-zero digit, it's significant, it counts, quote unquote. So any number one through nine that is not zero, by default, is a significant digit. All right, so if we're looking at this number 112.1, that value has four sig figs. If you have a zero in between non-zero digits, so it's sandwiched in between the number 101, right, that zero would be significant. So zeros are the ones that mess with your head the most. Number two is, is easiest. If it's, excuse me, a zero in between non-zero digits, that zero is also significant. So for instance, 305 would have three sig figs. 50.08, so 50 and 8 hundredths would have four sig figs. Because these zeros count. They're in between non-zero digits, therefore they count. Now the next couple of rules both deal with zeros, and these are the rules about zeros that give students the most trouble. So if it doesn't make sense, please ask, okay? Because we're gonna be using sig figs for the rest of the semester in both our measurements and our calculations. So if the zeros rules, and those are the ones that, that cause the most confusion. If they cause you any sort of problem, let's talk about it now. So let's talk about zeros to the left of a non-zero digit. Zeros to the left. And what does that mean? This is a number that's less than one, right? So 0 0.000005, right? Those are zeros to the left. Any zero to the left is not significant, okay? Because, let's think about this. If you have the value 0 0.0023, that is a measurement that you could get from my analytical balance back there. My balance goes to four decimal places, okay? If you go back over there and you are measuring out a quantity of whatever, right? That's a value that my scale back there could give you, my digital, my digital balance. What are you actually measuring? This isn't a measured value, is it? This zero right here? No, it's not an actual measured value. It's just a placeholder, right? This zero is telling me, okay, the number that I'm measuring is smaller than zero. And this zero right here, also, that zero is telling me, okay, the, the measurement is less than the zero right here. So these are just space holders, right? You could have put just like an underscore there if you really wanted to. It's just telling me that the actual measurement doesn't start until I get to the thousandth place. Does this make sense? If you imagine these zeros not here and just put like a little underscore, right? That would still be the same measurement. Because when you write this number in scientific notation, what happens to these zeros? They go away, right? They're literally just placeholders. So I didn't measure this zero, I didn't measure this zero, and I definitely didn't measure this zero, right? They're just placeholders. What did I measure? I measured these two values, okay? So this value has two sig figs. Any zero to the left is insignificant. When you write that in scientific notation, they go away, right? What you're left with are the significant figures. Zeros to the left get a lot of people in trouble, okay? Because they're so used to writing them and seeing them and thinking about them, but they're not actual measured values. You're only measuring the two and three. And so here's another example, right? This one's got a bunch of zeros. 
what am I measuring? I'm not measuring any of this. I'm only actually measuring that. Does that make sense? So if I put a hair on my balance, which would be a lot smaller than that, but let's just pretend, right? All those zeros leading up to it are not actual measurements. Measurement of the hair starts when I hit the non-zero digit. Now again, this is zeros to the left. So obviously if we're gonna talk about zeros to the left, we're gonna talk about zeros to the right. And they follow different rules. Zeros to the right, sometimes they're significant, sometimes they're not. So let's look at zeros to the right. Zeros to the right of a non-zero are significant if and only if a decimal is present. Only if there's a decimal. Okay, that decimal tells you whether or not a zero to the right is significant. Because that decimal place tells you where the measuring stops and the approximating begins. So let's look at this. My balance back there actually goes to four decimal places. So let's just pretend it's 1.2000. Let's pretend there's another zero right here. All right? My balance back there goes to four. This decimal place tells me, yes, that two is a measured value. That zero is a measured value, and that zero is a measured value. These are actual measurements that just happen to be zero. Okay, if there's a decimal, a zero to the right counts, always. Decimal present, zero to the right counts. Now zeros to the right without a decimal, not significant. So if there's a zero to the right and there's no decimal place, then it is an insignificant value. So let's look at this. 100, no decimal place. 100 with no decimal. All right, a great example of glassware that would give you 100 with no decimal place. Do I have any beakers? Yes. 100 with no decimal place. My good friend, the beaker, right? This is measured in 20s, 20, 20, 40, well, 20, it's measured in tens, excuse me. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. If I fill that up to right there, right, this is measured in tens. Even if I get it right on the line, am I positive that it's exactly 100 when the tick marks are measured in tens? Because if it's slightly below 100, well, it could be 90, it could be 97, it could be 102 if it's above 100, right? Beakers should never give you a decimal place. If you're in the lab and you're measuring a volume with a beaker, do not put a decimal place in your answer because okay? beakers don't give you that level of accuracy. And sometimes you don't need that level of accuracy. You know, if I said add 100 milliliters of water, and it doesn't really matter if it's 101 or 103 or 99, right? As long as you're getting it to dissolve something, right? That'd be a time when you don't need seven decimal places. So sometimes you don't need that level of accuracy. A beaker is not going to give you decimal places ever. So just make a note to yourself this semester when you're recording volumes, if you're using a beaker, your answer had better not have any decimal places because you can't get that level of accuracy from a beaker. It's just not, not going to happen. Okay. So if there's no decimal place, that means that this is only about one sig fig. That means this value is about 100, but it could be 99, could be 97, could be 104. We don't know. We just know that it's about 100. Now, 100 with a decimal place, that's telling me, yes, it is 100, but I'm not certain what decimal place is beyond that it is. So I've got a couple of balances that measure one decimal place, and then I think I've got one that doesn't give any decimal places. But maybe you can think of like a stopwatch. Stopwatch is a good example. Some stopwatches don't give decimal places at all, right? They just give the number. So if it doesn't have a decimal place, not significant zeros. If it does have a decimal, those zeros are significant. And what if it was 100.00? Would those zeros after the decimal place be significant? Yes, they would. Okay, so if it was 100.00, we'd have five significant. The decimal determines whether or not zeros to the right count. Zeros to the left, never count. Oh, I have one in there, look at that. Okay, do we see the difference between these three measurements and the accuracy of them? Now the, the one time you don't need sig figs, 
would be a number that you get by counting, okay? If I said, how many faucets are in this room? The probability of there being error in your answer is pretty much zero, unless you're just not paying attention, right? One, two, three, four, you can just count the number of faucets. How many circles, right? That's not something that's got any ambiguity to it. So if it's just a counting number where it's a large object, how many stools are in here? How many tiles are on the floor, right? No sig figs needed there. We're not gonna be counting in this class, but just so you know, that is one example where you don't have to worry about significant figures. Okay, so let's just do these together. How many sig figs are in each of these numbers? You can shout it out if you're comfortable, or you can just think of it mentally and see if you get it right. Anyone wanna tell me how many sig figs are in number one? Five, good. What about in number two? Four, good. What about this one? Three, and what about this one? Four, right. Which four are they? Three, zero, four, zero, right. Why are these not significant? They're to the left, they're just placeholders, right? You could just imagine a heart right here to hold the place. That doesn't have to be a number, that's just a placeholder. These are the actual measurements, good. Okay, let's do some more practice with this. I'm actually going to pause the recording, let you try this on your paper, and then we'll go over it. Because for my students who are online, I want to give them a chance to try it on their own. So, pause the recording. All right, let's go over these and see if you got them right. How many sig figs are in A? Three, good. How many are in B? Four. Good. How many are in C? Three. Three. Good. How many are in D? Four. Good. How many are in E? Just one. Right. Why is that one sig fig and not two? There's no decimal place. Good. Uh, number E is the one that most people would. If you're going to struggle with a zero, it's probably ones that involve the decimal place versus no decimal place. And F, how many? Four, good. Why is the zero to the <coughs> left not significant, but this one is? To the left's a placeholder, to the right, if there's a decimal, that's not a placeholder, that's an actual measurement. Good. All right, let's talk about what do we do if we make some recordings of length or width or height or whatever, and then we have to do some calculations, right, because that happens a lot. We'll make a measurement of mass, and then we'll make a measurement of volume, and then we'll calculate the density, That's what we're gonna be doing today. We need to know, what do I do in terms of sig figs? Because when I'm adding and subtracting or multiplying and dividing, my sig fig rules need to apply. Because my calculated answer can never be more accurate than the numbers that were used to make the calculation. Does that make sense? If I'm adding a really lousy number to a really accurate number, I can't get a really accurate answer. You're only as good as your worst measurement. So anytime you're adding or subtracting, you punch it into your calculator just like you normally would, it spits out an answer. Now your calculator doesn't know anything about sig figs. Your calculator just adds, right? It's not smart, it doesn't know sig figs. So then you need to round your final answer to the least number of decimal places. Decimal places are what we go by when we add or subtract. So if I'm adding these three numbers, this one's about two digits after. Both of these have three. So how many decimal places will my final answer have? Two or three? Two, right? Because I'm only as good as my worst measurement. And when I'm adding or subtracting, I round to the least number of decimal places. But again, my calculator's not gonna know that. My calculator isn't gonna know that. When I punch this all into my calculator, the calculator's gonna say, 102.732, right? Because it doesn't know sig figures. It just knows what you've punched in. You need to remember, okay, I have to round based on accuracy. So this is the least number of decimal places. So when we're adding or subtracting, we go by decimal places. Here's an example involving subtraction. So how many decimal places will I be keeping in this one? One, right? Two versus one. Therefore, I'm rounding to, oops, one decimal place, okay? And that's when we add or subtract. Add or subtract the values. Make sense? Everybody good? 
I believe both of these examples are in the notes online. Now, when we multiply or divide, the rules are different because when I'm multiplying, that error gets propagated faster when I multiply or divide, right? So we have to have different sig fig rules for multiplication and division. If I'm multiplying or dividing, I do my arithmetic just like I normally would, punch it into my calculator. My calculator is going to spit out an answer with like 12 decimal places, depending on what kind of calculator you're using, right? But my calculator is dumb. My calculator doesn't know anything about sig figs. So I have to round my answer to the least number of total significant figures, not decimal places, but total sig figs. Because a small error when I multiply it gets carried along faster, right? So that means I have to have different rules for sig figs. So if I've got 1.4 times 8.011, I punch that into my calculator. Now, depending on the calculator you have, your calculator might even have more decimal places than that. Well, I can't keep all these numbers, right? Because this value is more accurate than the numbers that were used to make it, right? And I can't have an answer that's more accurate than the original numbers. So what does this round to? What would I round my answer to? Anyone want to try a guess? 11, right, because this has two sig figs, this has four. I'm only as accurate as my worst measurement, so my final answer is 11, right, two sig figs. Does that make sense? You're only as accurate as your worst measurement. If you measure this value really poorly and you measure this value really well, well, that's great that you measured one of them really well, but unfortunately, because you measured this one really poorly, your final answer has to reflect that. Your final answer can never be more accurate than your worst measurement, and your final answer can never be more accurate even than your best measurement. Same's gonna work for division, okay? Same's gonna work for division, whether you multiply or divide, you're going to round your final answer to the least number of total sig figs. So four versus five. So my final answer will have four sig figs. Okay? And bear in mind that this zero right here is not significant. It's just a placeholder. Okay? Zeros are the one that causes the most headache. Is everybody good? I'm multiplying and dividing with sig figs. We're going to be doing a lot of multiplying and dividing. You're going to be doing multiplication and division on uh, lab, my first lab. Okay, now the last thing that I want to talk about before you have some that you want to try is what if you're doing a multi-step calculation where, say, you multiply two numbers and then you take that value and then you multiply by another number, where you multiply two values and then you divide by a number. Okay, the thing you want to do is you want to carry out extra decimal places in step one and then round at the very end, okay? Round at the very, very end. We're going to be doing a lot of calculations this semester where maybe we'll multiply three numbers and then we'll divide by five, take an average or whatever, you know? We're going to round at the very, very end, okay? Because we can accumulate what's called a rounding error. If I round here and then round again, that could make my final answer too high or too low, okay? Because rounding can push my answer up too high or it could push my answer down too low, depending on what kind of rounding I'm doing. So let's just pretend that uh, we're, we're figuring out the dosage of a medicine, okay? That's something we want to be really accurate. We don't want to have any error in that or the minimum amount of error. So here's what I get when I round after each step. Versus rounding at the end, 65.2, 65.3, you might say, oh, that's no big deal. Well, that's still a tenth. Let's talk about grams, a tenth of a gram. It's still a decent amount, right? We're talking about dosage of a medication. That could be a big difference, right? You could give your patient not enough, right? So you always want to carry out at least one extra decimal place, if not more. Um, if you're doing this in your calculator, you could just punch these numbers in and then just hit times two on one, right? So you wouldn't even need to round it at all if you wanted to do that. And then you round at the end to three sig figs. Make sense? Always round at the end when you have multiple steps. Okay, so that was the same slide in there twice, not sure about that. So that's a recap, right? Anything that's not a zero is significant by default. 
uh, in between non-zero digits always significant as well. Zeros to the left are never significant. Zeros to the right are only significant if there is a guess. All right, let's just shout these out because it'll only take you a few seconds to do these. Let's round each of these numbers to two sig figs, not two decimal places, two sig figs. How would we round number one? To two sig figs. 61? Yep. How would we round number two? 4.2, right, because that seven rounds it up to two. And then, of course, we need to carry our units with us, so that'd be 61 milliliters, 4.2 grams. How would we round number three to two sig figs? 0 0.0, two sig figs. Remember, this zero, is it significant? No, it's not, right? It's a placeholder. So it's not 0.04, it'd be 0 0.036. Right? This zero is not significant. And then we would need to take our unit with us. Are we good on these three? Again, those zeros, those are the ones that get you, right? Zeros to the left, never significant. They don't count as a measurement. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. I'm going to give you a chance to try these. And then we'll go over them. So let's go over these. Now, again, if I ever give you units, you need to make sure that your answer includes units too, okay? Because units are a big thing for us. Because we don't have just a number, that number represents a quantity, right? Is that a quantity, a measure of mass, measure of volume, measure of temperature, what? So make sure that if your units are given, that your answer has units too. Okay, so for part A, this is addition. So are we going by total sig figs or decimal places? Decimal, right. So we're going by decimal places. So my final answer can only have how many decimal places? One, right? So 318.2 and milliliters plus milliliters gives me milliliters. So my final answer is 318.2 mils. Questions on A? Did you get it right? You made a mistake, you see you made it. That's what's important. Let's do B. Subtraction, just like addition, we go by what? Decimal places, right. So, two versus three, so my final answer can have two, right? So, again, liters minus liters gives me liters. Do we agree on B? All right, let's do C. Now, this is division. What are we going to do here? It's total sig figs, right. And what are my units going to be? When I take grams and divide it by liters, what will my units be? Grams per liter, right. So you'd write it as G slash L, right? That would be your units. And my final answer can only have how many sig figs? Three. So that's what my calculator spits out, a whole bunch of decimal places that I can't keep. So my final answer can only have three significant figures. And my units would be grams per liter. Do we agree? All right, here's E. So what's centimeters times centimeters in terms of units? Centimeters squared, right. And how many sig figs am I keeping? Three. So my calculator gives me that, but I know I need to round it to three significant figures. And now on E, Remember, I gave you your answer. I gave you the numbers in scientific notation. If it's easier for you to expand those out before you do the division, that's fine. Or you can enter the scientific notation straight into your calculator. You're going to get the same answer either way. What's grams divided by grams? Grams divided by grams cancels, right? When you divide, we have the same number on the top and on the bottom. It cancels. So what will my units be for E? It won't be. It'll be unitless. Right? It'll be unitless. Because grams divided by grams, that cancels. How many sig figs am I keeping? Three. Right. Do you care, like for C, Oops. Um, if we have it in scientific, but like, do you care if it's mm -hmm. just... If you wrote it as 1.09 times 10 to the negative first? Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Let's stop here for a few minutes, take a brain break. Pause the video soon. All right, now that our brains are a little refreshed, 
Let's just shout these out and then we're gonna move on to density. Let's round each of these to three sig figs. There are no units here, so we don't need to worry about that. How would I round the first one to three sig figs? 61.4, good. What about the second one? 2.17, good. The third option? 0 0.0665, right? You could write that in scientific notation as 6.65 times 10 to the negative 2. What about option 1, 2, 3, 4? Three sig figs. This one's going to be kind of tr tricky, isn't it? 50.0, right. 50.0, good. Because that 9 rounds us up to a 50. I can't just write 50, right? Because if I wrote 50 with no decimal place, that would only have one sig fig. Right? So to write 50... Three sig figs needs to be 50.0. Good. What about second to the last one? Three sig figs. Three A two, but don't forget, these don't go away, right? It's not 382. What would it be? It'd be 38,200, right? Because a lot of students will just say, oh, this five rounds us to a two, there's no decimal place. So yes, those two zeros are not significant digits, but they can't go away, right? Because 38,200 and 382 are very, very different. Okay, so those two zeros do have to stay, they just don't count as sig figs. That one's kind of a tricky one too. And then the last one, how will we round it? A lot of students would just say zero. That's something I see really regularly, because they'd say, oh, that's 0, 0.00. Is that the correct rounding? What would it be? It's probably easier to put this one in scientific notation, for sure. 3 point what? 3.89 times 10 to the negative. 1, 2, 3. A lot of students would just say zero. I see that a lot as, a, as an answer. They say, oh, 0, 0.00, right? And that's not correct because all these zeros here are not significant. Those zero ones, those are the ones you've got to watch for. All right, let's try one more just to make sure we're good at this. I'll pause the video, give you a few seconds to try this one. All right, let's go over these. So, we punch it into our calculator just like we normally would. How many sig figs can we keep in the first one? One, right, just one sig fig, so that's just 50, no decimal place. Do we agree? One sig fig. So if you put uh, 50.0 or 49 or something like that, right, that's two decimal places. Has to be 50. What about the second one, how many sig figs? This one's two sig figs, right? Because 0.8 has one sig fig, 0 0.80 has two sig figs. So my final answer here contains two significant figures. And then how many significant figures am I keeping in the third one? Three. And again, if you're doing this, carry out at least one decimal place extra, if not more. You can just punch this into your calculator, and then don't do anything, and then just hit divide by, and then it'll just carry out all those decimal places. That's fine. That's totally fun. For the second one, mm -hmm. would it be wrong to put a zero after the 80? Yes, because that would be three sig figs. If it was 80.0, zeros after the zeros um, to the right count if there's a decimal. So if it was 80.0, that would be three sig figs. If you did something like that on a test, so I wouldn't count the whole thing wrong. I'd count like half a point. I usually give half point for sig figs. Unless it's just an obscene. <laughs> Right, if you put 80.0000, right, that would be different from 80.0. That's a good question. All right, do we feel good about this? Do you need to do some more? Well, here they are. You can go back and look at them on the lecture if you would like. I'll put the answers on here now. These are all multi-step ones. I think most of you, based on the looks on your faces, seem to have it down. You're feeling pretty good about multiplying, dividing with six things. 
Okay, let's talk about errors, because in the lab we're gonna make errors, and that's okay, it happens, right? Um, in our lab reports, we're gonna talk about the errors that we made. And there are two types of errors that we're gonna encounter most frequently. First one's called a random error. It occurs once, it affects only one trial. All right, so if you're doing an experiment three times, and let's pretend in trial three, you sneeze into your beaker. That's a random error. That's not something you could have predicted. It's really not something you could have prevented, but it would only affect trial three, all right? It wouldn't have affected trial one or trial two. So if you're um, having a random error, or maybe you're walking over to the balance to record the mass and you trip over your feet and you spill. Okay, that's a random error, right? Because it's not gonna affect trial one, it's not gonna affect trial two. So something that happens once, in the entire experiment, it'll affect one data point, but it's not gonna affect the others. That's called a random error. So your spills, um, something boils over. Right, let's pretend you're doing an experiment three times. And in trial two, you're heating it and it boils over. Ah, oh, I lost some of my product. That's not gonna affect trial three, and you're probably gonna learn from that mistake and not heat it so fast. All right, so in some times, in some instances, those random errors actually help us do better. Because if something weird happens in trial one, we're going to be more careful in trial two. Okay, so random errors affect one measurement, but they're not going to affect subsequent uh, experiments, subsequent trials, I should say. Now, a systematic error is going to affect all your trials. It's going to affect first trial, second trial, third trial, 50th trial, because it's something that will be used in all your measurements. So for instance, if I'm using the balance back there, if I don't calibrate it, if it's off-center, every measurement is going to be off, right? If it's not level, every measurement's off by 5%. Uh, that stinks. Now all my data are skewed, right? The nice thing about a systematic error is if I figure out after the fact, hey, my balance was off by 5%, I could go back in and adjust my data accordingly. But that's assuming that you figure out that you had a systematic error in the first place, right? If you can figure out, oh, man, my balance was off by 3% today, I can go back in and adjust all my data. But that's assuming that I know that the balance was off by 2%. Is one better than the other? No, no, not really. Because they're both errors, they're both gonna affect your accuracy, right? Just the severity of it's gonna depend on what kind of error you made, right? I mean, if you drop your trial that you've been working on for four hours, it's really gonna be a bummer, right? But at least it only affect one trial or maybe, you know, it's off by 20%. And so you've been working all day, but you're 20% off. That's a big deal too. So they're both gonna happen. Um, hopefully we can prevent them. Which one do you think you have more likely to happen to you guys? Random or systematic? Random's probably gonna happen to you, right? Because the systematic's gonna be my fault. <laughs> I'm the one who calibrates the instruments. I'm the one who makes sure that the balances are leveled. Right, so I'm usually the one who's responsible for the systematic error. The one systematic error you could make, though, is what if you are done with your experiment and you realize, oh my goodness, I wasn't reading the thermometer correctly. Every time I recorded a measurement on the thermometer, the bar was here and I thought it was, I was adding 10 to it, okay, right? That's a systematic error that you could make. But primarily, you're gonna be making more random errors than systematic, but it can happen. All right, let's talk about density. That's the last topic for today. Density is something that we can use to identify a substance because all substances have unique densities. So density is the relationship, I mean the ratio, excuse me, between mass and volume. It's mass divided by volume. So this is something kind of cheesy. I used to teach it to my students when I taught middle school and high school. If you think about how much you love this class, it's just your favorite, you love it. You, know, you think about like Cupid's arrow and everything, heart with an arrow. The top part looks like an M, and the bottom part looks like a V. So you can remember the formula for density that way, right? So the units are obviously going to vary based on the problem. If mass is given in kilograms in the problem, then the unit and the density would be in kilograms, right? And if the unit in the problem is given in milliliters, then you would have milliliters here. What's the centimeter cube the same thing as? Milliliters, right? CC, centimeters cubed in milliliters, they're the same thing. Um, that's not on page 48. In the current edition, I'm not sure what it is, but your textbook's got a list of densities, right? So that's one of the things you're gonna do in lab this week. 
um, you're going to record some masses and some volumes, and then you're going to identify it based on its density, because each uh, item will have a unique density. And the nice thing about density is that things separate out based on their densities. Okay, so that's a picture that I took several years ago now, right, of different substances separated by density. And here's one from a textbook. Right? Liquid mercury is really dense. It's got a density of 13.1 grams per milliliter versus water is one. Right? The density of water is one. So if this 1.5 liter container was filled with mercury, it'd be really heavy. 13.1 grams per milliliter versus one gram per milliliter. Right? A lot of stuff's going to float on top of liquid mercury because it's just so darn dense. All right, so let's do this one together. Ice cubes float in a glass of water because solid water is less dense than liquid water. It's one of the new, unique things about H2O. Calculate the density of ice if, at zero degrees Celsius, a cube that is two centimeters on each side, right? So we made ice cubes in the freezer in a little tray, and it was two by two by two. A cube has a, has a measurement on each side by two, and each cube has a mass of 7.36 grams. So let's do part A together. Calculate the density of that ice. So we're going to need a couple of things before we can calculate the density. We're going to need to know, okay, if density is equal to mass over volume, the problem gives us the mass, right? 7.36 grams, there's my mass. But does it give me the volume in the problem? No, it doesn't. But I can determine it somehow. If this is 2, and is it 2.0? Yes, it's 2.0. 2.0. How do I get volume of a cube? Right, so the volume is just 2.0 centimeters cube. So 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8. How many sig figs will I keep? Is it 8 or is it 8.0? It'd be 8.0. And then what would my units be? When you cube centimeters, centimeters times centimeters times centimeters gives me what? Centimeters cubed, right. Now if you don't like centimeters cubed, if that just bothers you, you could also write that as what? Milliliters, right. Same thing. Those units are interchangeable. Now I have everything I need, right? I know the mass from the problem. I know the volume because I just calculated it. So now I can calculate density. So the mass was 7.36 grams. The volume is 8. And again, you can use centimeters cubed or milliliters, whichever floats your boat. And then in our calculator, 7.36 divided by 8. My calculator gives me 0.92. How many sig figs am I keeping? Two sig figs, right. So that's 0 0.92. And my units would be grams per centimeter cubed. You could have also written it as 92 grams per milliliter. Does the fact that it's at zero degrees Celsius factor into the problem at all, what I do in the math? Nope. Extra information. Okay, let's do B. So that was A. B, determine the volume, so volume is what I'm looking for, occupied by 23 grams. So grams is that mass density, what's that? That's mass of ice at zero degrees Celsius. So we just calculated the density here, right? Let's just use grams per mil this time. So can I solve for volume? Is that something I'm able to do? Yeah, just plug into the density equation, right? If density is equal to mass over volume, density I've already got, so 0 0.92 is equal to 23 over V, right? Get rid of V, multiply both sides by V. 
So that gives me 0 0.92 V is equal to 23. So how do I get V by itself? Divide by 0.92. How many significant figures am I keeping here? Two. Two, right. So 25. And what are my units? To get units, I have to look at what the units were in density for volume, right? So it's either going to be 25 mils. You could have also written 25 centimeters cubed. Questions on how we did either one of those. So sometimes it might not be straight up M over V, right? Sometimes you could be solving for M or V if you know the density. So don't get used to it just being dividing two numbers, right? It could also be doing a little bit of algebra to solve for volume or mass if you know the density. Make sense? Everybody good? All right, so you do this one. If the mass of the cube is 11.2 grams, what is the density? Include units and sig fig rules. I'll pause the video. All right, let's look at the answer to this one. If the mass is 11.2 grams, what is the density? Now we know that this is a cube. Will we need to use volume displacement to get the volume here? No, that's a regularly shaped object. So we just get the volume by cubing two, but unlike the previous problem, that one in the previous one was 2.0, how many sig figs will this give us when we get the density? I mean, we get the volume, just one, right. And our final answer will also have how many sig figs? Just one, right. So my calculator may say 1.4, but I can't keep that four right, because of this. I only measured that a little more accurately, right? I got around it to one. You could write gram per centimeter cubed, or you could write gram per milliliter. Same thing. Here's another one for you to do. An empty container with a volume of 9.85 times 10 to the second centimeters cubed is found to have a mass of 124.6 grams. The container is then filled with a gas. The mass of the container and the gas together is 126.5 grams. What is the density of the gas with sig fig rules and units? I will pause the recording here. So here we have to think about what the problem's giving us. Because do we want to include the mass of the container in the density calculation? No, right? Because we don't want the density of the container and the gas. We want just the mass of the gas, right? We don't want the container to be in there. And this is something you're going to do a lot in lab, not with measuring gases, but with measuring mass of a liquid, right? I can't take my beaker over there and just pour water. Oh, that's a bunch of waste, <laughs> right? But I can figure out the mass of the beaker when it's empty and then add whatever my liquid is and then get the mass of them together. And then how would I get the mass of the liquid? Subtract out the mass of the empty beaker, right? And that's what we're doing here. We know how much the container had a mass of by itself. So we filled it with the gas, we knew it was total. So to get the mass of the gas, I need to subtract, right? Because if I use 126.5 grams as my mass, well then I've got the density of them together, which I don't want. I just want the density of the gas. So I get the mass of the gas. Do I need to do anything to get volume? Nope, that was given to me, all right? So one decimal place for my mass, two sig figs total which means how many sig figs will my density have? Two sig figs, right. So 0 0.00193, which I would prefer you write in scientific notation. So that would be point in 1.9 times 10 to the negative third. I mean, if you put 0 0.00193, 
and run on the couch wrong. We just like to get in the habit of when you've got lots of zeros to put it in scientific notation, easier on the eye. If you wrote your units as grams per milliliter, would that be okay? Yes. All right, one last one. What is the mass of an object whose density is 1.536 kilograms per liter, has a volume of 78.42 liters? I'll pause the video, let you try this one. Last problem. Mass of an object, so now we're solving for the numerator, right? Because we know the density, we know the volume. So we're solving for the M component, right? We're not solving for the D, we're solving for the M. So if density is mass over volume, how do I get mass by itself? Multiply both sides by Z, right? Mass is equal to density times volume. And keeping four sig figs, 120.5. Why is my mass here kilograms and not grams? How do I know the unit for mass? I look at the density, right? The density was in kilograms per liter. That means that the mass must have been in kilograms. Now, if you plugged it in directly, plugged in 1.536 here, plugged in 78.42 here, and just did the algebra like you learned in high school, you get the exact same answer. Okay. I just rearranged it first and then plugged in. You could plug in and then rearrange, you'll get the same answer. Questions on this one? If you made a mistake, you see you made it. Everybody good on density? Feeling good? Feeling good? Okay, we will be doing density in lab this week, so I want to make sure we get through all that. And that's where we'll stop for today.